Imagine standing in a room filled with lush greenery and thinking that you're alone, but you're not. What if I told you that the plants around you right now are listening, feeling, and responding to your every thought? These plants, silent yet vibrant, could be holding onto secrets far beyond our comprehension. For some, that's simply a whimsical or <laughs> pants on head crazy thought, but for an IBM scientist turned botanical innovator, it was the doorway to understanding a vast uncharted territory, plant consciousness. Welcome to the History of Plants. I'm Megan Brain. Today, we're exploring the mind-bending research of Marcel Vogel, the scientist who discovered the secret language of plant consciousness. Marcel Vogel was born on April 14, 1917 in San Francisco, California. As a child, he was by all accounts full of curiosity and wonder, a trait that most likely came in handy in his adult years. Unfortunately, he was plagued with respiratory issues as a child, making it difficult for him to experience the quote unquote normalcy of childhood. His respiratory problems got so bad that he was actually pronounced dead at the age of six due to double lobular pneumonia. Obviously he survived, but you have to wonder how impactful that must have been for a child. Did it pique his curiosity to understand the natural world better? Did it make him more open to the world we can't see? Marcel became fascinated with fireflies, specifically the mechanics behind how they generated light. He ended up becoming kind of a wonderkind, translating German articles on phosphor chemistry and manufacturing phosphors on his own all before the age of 15. What were you doing when you were 15? He and Dr. Peter Pringsheim published a book in 1943 called The Luminescence of Liquids and Solids and Their Practical Application and opened his company Vogel Luminescence Corp, which manufactured fluorescent paints for outdoor signage and billboards, in addition to patenting a blacklight kit which the company claimed could detect cancer, rodent contamination, or be used for milk inspection. During this time, he also did part-time consulting for IBM, working on magnetic coating formulas that are still used to this day on IBM hard disks. Um, let me give you some context for the way Vogel experienced the world. The story of how he came to figure out the process for creating this coating goes like this. He's in his lab working 18 to 20 hour days, just trying to crack this magnetic coating formulation, but nothing is going right. One day he literally collapses from exhaustion. And as he comes to, he says that he felt as though he was in a dreamlike state. In this state, he notices a can of molasses floating in front of him and the words infinite viscosity forming in his mind. That was his eureka moment when he realized the formula required two previously thought incompatible chemical compounds to be combined. And thus, problem solved, innovation created, history changed. In 1957, Vogel Luminescence Corp was sold and he moved over to IBM full-time working in their data products division. He became a prolific inventor for the company, playing a crucial role in the creation of the first liquid crystal displays known today as LCDs. His impressive portfolio included numerous patents and scientific papers. His work with rare earth phosphors gave us the ability to have red hues in TV programs and he is considered a pioneer thanks to his work inventing solutions for degasifying liquids, photoconduction, and dark field microscopy. But beneath the surface of his corporate success was that insatiable curiosity just waiting to be released. And that release came in the form of an unlikely source, an employee at the CIA. One of my favorite facts about Vogel is that he wasn't just a researcher working off in like a dark corner somewhere. He was actually a pretty social, amicable dude. He actually taught creativity at IBM, which, yeah, if I wanted to learn about creativity, Vogel's probably the best guy I would want to teach it. In 1969, during one of his lectures, he was given a copy of Argosy magazine, which had an article called, Do Plants Have Emotions? The article was about the work of one Grover Cleveland Cleve Baxter Jr. Cleve is another fantastic guy who I will cover in a future episode, but suffice to say for this one that he is the founder of the CIA's polygraph unit and used polygraphs on plants. He believed that plants could respond to human emotion and was using the electrodes on the polygraph to research whether or not a plant had the ability to have extrasensory perception. The scientific community mostly rejected his work. Although L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, apparently was a big fan. 
Also, as an aside, L. Ron Hubbard actually also published a paper about using polygraphs on tomato plants, though he called them the e-meter. Anyhow, Vogel reads the article and initially believes Baxter is ridiculous. He brings it into class the next day to talk about how he felt it was, quote, nonsense, but was intriguing nonetheless. He and his students, ever the scientists, decided, eh, what the heck, let's give his theories a shot and see what happens. Vogel said this all happened around late November, early December 1969. So in my head, it's like one of those weeks in school right before winter break when nothing's really going on and you're all kind of waiting out the clock. So why not get a little crazy? Anyhow, the students build an electrode machine and Vogel builds his own. Their builds utilize something called a Wheatstone bridge, which is a four point diamond shaped electrical circuit with two input terminals to output terminals, a galvanometer that measures electrical current and a power source. Admittedly, this is not my wheelhouse, but I'm gonna take my best shot explaining it. So the thing you want to test is hooked up to two of the terminals. On the other two terminals is essentially a stable electrical current, which you know the level of. Once the power source is turned on, an electrical current flows through the terminals hooked up to the object being measured, while the terminals feeding the control current are adjusted to equal the amount of electrical current the thing being tested is sending out. Once these two sides are balanced, the current stops flowing to the galvanometer and you know how much electrical resistance an object makes. Adding an amplifier to it lets you measure parameters like temperature, light, and strain at incredibly low levels. It's actually a really surprisingly accurate and precise tool, even though it was invented in 1833. So in this story, two electrodes are put on a monstera leaf one on the top and the other on the underside. The two Wheatstone bridges are hooked up to a strip chart recorder, like a, the output a polygraph has, you know, with the like peaks and valleys. Baxter's research says that if the plant cells on the leaf reacted to the electrical current, the Wheatstone bridges output would make the recording needle move, recording the fluctuation and showing that the plant experiences a reaction to stimuli. So they turn on both bridges for days and nothing happens. The students think that they've proven Baxter's experiment was bunk. Vogel, however, isn't ready to give up. He enlists the help of Dr. Jan Thomas to help him run additional experiments. Now, the details are fuzzy on this point, but Vogel says they took the experiment into a dark room and began to tweak the parameters. What I can deduce from the sources is that Vogel probably dove a little more into Baxter's work and noticed Baxter believed the plant could react to thoughts of specifically danger directed towards it. Vogel begins to test this by focusing on the thought of doing the plant harm while also varying his breathing patterns. He and Thomas wondered if there would be a difference between breathing slowly versus pulsing his breath through his nostrils. Then on December 3rd, 1969, Vogel claims to have proven Baxter right. Plants will not only respond to electrical stimuli, but they have a consciousness that can anticipate and prepare itself for, well, trauma. Specifically, Vogel claims he was able to show that a plant could react if it anticipated trauma, such as a leaf being torn or the entire plant being uprooted or burnt, a replication of Baxter's 1966 experiments. But interestingly, Vogel claimed that this wasn't a response to active stimuli like him actually ripping the leaf. Rather, it was the plant reacting to the energy given off from Vogel's thoughts of him doing it. He says, quote, for the first time I had validation of the fact that when you think a thought, an energy transfer takes place between you and the object or person you are focusing on. That energy transfer was sufficiently powerful to change the electrical balance of the leaf and the plant system I was working on, end quote. Understandably, the execs at IBM weren't interested in whether or not plants had psychic abilities and refused to continue running more experiments like this in their labs. So Vogel took his work, plant and electrodes home to continue what was then dubbed the Baxter effect on his own time. He later dubbed Baxter his plant guru. In 1984, he retired from IBM after 27 years. His retirement gift, $500,000 in equipment donated by IBM that he used to open Psychic Research Incorporated, where he continued to work on the potential for plant consciousness, though his later career focused more heavily on restructuring water for use as an energy source, plus crystals and his belief in their healing capabilities. He actually pioneered a cut shape for crystals known as Vogel cuts, which his followers believe enhances a crystal's energy, helping it to act as a quote, carrier wave of information. Mm -hmm. 
Focusing on the plant side, Vogel's findings open a Pandora's box of questions. He proposed that plants could anticipate danger, responding not only to physical harm, but also to the emotional states of people around them. In fact, they seem to mirror human mental and emotional states, creating a unique feedback loop between our minds and the natural world. Even more intriguingly, Vogel theorized that plants might act as batteries, capable of storing the energy of our thoughts and intentions. But how could that be possible? Vogel speculated on the role of microtubules, the tiny structures found within the cells of a plant, and how they might enable a form of consciousness akin to what we observe in the animal kingdom. The idea was radical, yet Vogel championed it, challenging long-held perceptions about consciousness itself. Vogel explained, quote, what a broad plant leaf does is provide an exceedingly sensitive antenna for the vibrations or musical notes we radiate in space." End quote. He discovered that through controlled breathing and focused intention, he could enter what he called a phase lock, which was an altered state of consciousness that allowed deep communication with plants. Marcel Vogel didn't just keep his discoveries to himself, he became a passionate advocate for plant-human communication organizing demonstrations that captivated audiences and inspired a wave of curiosity and research into the field. In one of his most dramatic demonstrations, produced for the first episode of In Search Of, which was hosted by Leonard Nimoy, Vogel showed how a plant could respond to sudden emotional releases on command. Just like, imagine that for a second. A plant so sensitive, it could read human emotions in real time. One of Vogel's most remarkable techniques involved coupling plants to pen recorders. This was an innovative approach because it allowed for real-time illustrations of a plant's electrical responses to his mental state. He explained, quote, the plant coupled to a pen recorder gave a live illustration of varying states of mind, running from irritation at an interviewer's questions to quiet tracings established when I was in harmonious intercommunication with the plant." End quote. These recordings painted a vivid picture of the emotional landscape allegedly shared between Vogel and the plants. In theory, they demonstrate that the plants could not only respond to human intentions, but also mirror emotional states in a way that beckoned deeper inquiry into the nature of consciousness. Not much is written about the end of his life, but he seemed to spend most of his remaining years focused heavily on his work at Psychic Research Incorporated. Marcel Vogel died on February 12th, 1991, at the age of 73. Now look, whether you believe his work was brilliant or bunk, his work opened a window into a world where plants are not silent, static objects, but dynamic, responsive organisms capable of sensing and communicating in ways we can't begin to understand. His work sparked ongoing debates, not only about plant biology, but biophysics and neurobiology, pushing the boundaries of how we define intelligence and consciousness in the living world. Was he a groundbreaking genius or a bizarre buffoon? I feel like the diplomatic response is, that's not for me to say, but to be honest, I have no idea. Most contemporary scientific studies believe that plant consciousness is not a thing. But then we kind of get into this sort of nebulous context, right? Like, did his ability to be such a prolific inventor and innovative thinker during his earlier years afford his later ideas some consideration? Or, did he become just another example of a brilliant eccentric who believed his own hype to the point of absurdity? Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments. As always, my sources are linked in the show notes for those who want a deeper dive. Feel free to join me in the episode commentary on Patreon or check out the podcast episode wherever you get podcasts. I'm Megan Brain. Thanks for joining me on this episode of The History of Plants. Until next time, greenies, stay curious and don't forget to flourish.